and you join us in welcoming to the pulpit of the cause of the times our friend, Brother Terry Black. May God bless you. Would you lift your hands and love the Lord with me right now? Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Reading to you from Joshua chapter 4, verse 21. While you're turning there, I want to express my appreciation to Brother Anthony Mangan, Brother Mangan Sr., for this committee for their invitation to be here today. I love them, appreciate their contribution to my life personally and to the United Pentecostal Church in the world for the Pentecostal impact that they have made. I looked around this place uh, today and last night and I... I saw so many who are icons of my heritage. So many here that are heroes to me, if I could say it that way. And what a tremendous honor it is to be a part of not only the body of Christ, but this great United Pentecostal Church and you wonderful people. I have a strong desire to do what I can to help keep this fellowship wonderful, strong, and powerful. I appreciate every one of you. I thank the Lord for you. To the leaders that are here of our fellowship, I appreciate you and respect you, and uh, I pray that <clears throat> we can go on and attain the vision that God has placed into the leadership, the ministry of the United Pentecostal Church. I was born into this thing. I believe it from the top of my head to the sole of my feet. But I thank God for the motivation that I feel that is being given to us to move out of the walls of our sanctuaries and try to take our world for the Lord. Joshua chapter 4 and verse 21. I've already received enough this week to make this trip worthwhile. For the Mangan, your ministry last night was powerful. And the ministries that we have heard today have been wonderful, stirring, and I pray that, <clears throat> and I feel a confirmation in the spirit, everybody that's been up here has jumped all over some of the things that I would like to try to say today. Joshua chapter 4, verse 21, he spake unto the children of Israel, saying, when your children shall ask their fathers in time to come, saying, what mean these stones? Then ye shall let your children know, saying, Israel came over this Jordan on dry land. I'd like to talk to you for a few moments today on the subject, Jesus is still in the Jordan. Jesus is still in the Jordan. If you believe that, shout unto the Lord right now with a voice of triumph. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. <clears throat> Praise God. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for your presence. Praise God. You may be seated, shake somebody's hand, and say, forget about me right now. It wasn't as if Joshua didn't have enough to do. He was the leader of 
Three million people on a 40-year camping trip, crossing the flooding, unnavigable Jordan River to Canaan. But this day, amidst all the excitement, one of the great concerns on Joshua's mind was a pile of rocks being erected on the Canaan side of Jordan. Make sure it's sturdy, son. Don't you forget to place that flag right on top so everybody can notice. Level out that ground over there. We want it to be just perfect. And on and on. He was building a memorial. Something that possibly would connect the future with the past. Joshua understood that if Israel was going to have a glorious and perpetual future, that it would be inspired by a clear memory of the past. Yes, son, in spite of all of the odds that Israel had, God made a passage through this Jordan on dry land. As we ponder our futures today, tomorrow, I feel this morning that there's something that we may draw from Joshua's experiences. And that is that we may need to go back at times to yesteryear in order to see glory tomorrow. Please don't misunderstand me. In all due respect, I'm not talking about going back to buggy whips, horse-drawn carriages, 10-mile walks to Sunday service. Neither am I referring to going back to sitting in the blazing heat beneath brush arbors or becoming more primitive or ineffectual in doing the work of the Lord. My feet are firmly planted in the day in which I live, and I understand that we're living in the dawning of the age of Aquarius, the era of, era of the microchip, virtual reality, gender-blending, cosmic consciousness, and comfort. But to go back, except for the purpose of inspiration, is not my desire. I'm content standing in the threshold of the 21st century. But there are priceless principles and great sacrifices from the past that will afford all of us the impetus to perpetuate a glorious future. When we stand on the Canaan side of the banks of our Jordan, like Joshua, there are certain things that I personally believe that we all can see as a memorial for our faith to inspire our future. I can see Joshua looking into Canaan. I can see the passion glowing from his face as he dreams of finally, after 40 years of wandering, getting back to where God wanted Israel to be. And there were some things that were going through his mind. First of all, possibly, as a memorial. When he looked at that pile of rocks and he remembered his own heritage, he remembered the damaging stories 40 years earlier as he stood among the 12 and he saw Moses fidgeting and trying to make a decision whether to move on into Canaan or whether to stay and wait for another time. And it was there that Joshua lived through the negative and the diabolical decision and witnessed the lack of faith that came from the ten who were sent to bring back, that brought back the negative report. He felt the pain. He felt the listlessness. He felt the wandering spirit as it enshrouded him like a yoke of bondage. And now, 40 years later, God had spoken to Joshua, who had been promoted to the leader of this great nation. 
And God had just previously said to him, Tomorrow I'm going to show you wonders. And it was as they crossed over to Canaan that Joshua learned that what God wanted to do then, he still wanted to do now. I want to say to this congregation today, I agree with my comrades who have been speaking here today and last night and last year. We believe, all of us, that this is a great time. We are standing on the brink of a great era. We are motivated, however, by some things of the past. And one of the things that comes into all of our minds is that God is not through with his church in 1997. What he wanted to do 40 years ago, he still wants to do now. Not only what God wanted to do then, he wants to do now. But what God was able to do then, he is still able to do now. Not only did he see God's continuing purpose when he looked at that memorial, but he also saw God's amazing methods. God has a way of blowing our mind every once in a while. I don't understand him. I can't figure it out. But I enjoy experiencing what God has in store from time to time as we come across our impossibilities. One of the things that blows my mind about the Lord is that he is willing to take his awesome, omnipotent, omniscience, and omnipresence and bundle it up and put it into the hands of flesh and let man interact and have a relationship with him. It was in Joshua chapter 3 that the Lord spoke to Joshua and gave him the plan for crossing Jordan. He said, when you see the ark of the covenant of your God, tell your people to follow it. Wherever it goes, you follow it. I want you to take the Ark of the Covenant. Put it on the shoulders of the men. Take the priest and put the Ark on the priest's shoulders. And I want your priest to walk before the people. And I want the people to step into Jordan. You see, they were crossing at a very precarious and perilous time. The Bible says in Joshua chapter 3 that the banks of Jordan always overflowed at harvest time. And it was at harvest time that God spoke to Joshua and said, I'm going to take you to Canaan land and you're going to do my will and you're going to experience my power. And it was at harvest time that they walked into the Jordan. It was at harvest time that God allowed them to experience a powerful miracle. Joshua spake to the priest, and he said, Take up the Ark of the Covenant. Pass over before the people. They took up the Ark of the Covenant. They went before the people. And then he said, When you get to the water, I want you to walk on into the water. And when your feet hit that water, God is going to intervene. And there is going to be a passage. I think it's interesting if you look in your commentaries that you'll find that this happened at a place called Bethabra. It means house of passage. It was at Bethabra, at harvest time, that God spoke to Joshua and said, I'm going to fulfill a dream in your heart. I'm going to make it a reality. And you're going to do it by doing exactly what I say to do. Tell your priest to march with the Spirit and walk into the Jordan. And when you feet hit the Jordan, I'm going to cause the water to pile up on each side in a heap. I'm going to cut the waters off from the north. I'm going to cut it off from the east. It's not going to come down. And there's going to be a passage. And your people are going to walk through on dry ground. If you can get that picture... What Joshua saw, the ark with the mercy seat, the blood, the rod that budded on the inside, the manna, the table of the law, the ark being carried on the shoulders of men, of the priest, God put his 
presence and his power in the hands of men. And now these men were standing in the middle of the Jordan River. Oh man, the Jordan River, what a place for God to choose to put his people at harvest time because the Jordan River meant to descend. The very name means a descender. It was a river that has never been navigable flowing into a sea that has never known a port. There's never been a high road to more hospitable coasts. There's never possessed a fishery. It's never boasted of a single town of eminence upon its banks. It winds through scenery remarkable rather for sameness and tameness rather than for bold outline. Its course is not much over 200 miles from first to last. About one-fifteenth of that of the Nile from the roots of Anta Lebanon where it burst forth from its various sources in all of its purity to the head of the Dead Sea where it loses itself in all of its tributaries in this unfathomable brine. This is the river of the Great Plain. Not only does its tributaries run through the Middle East, but it runs into generations into the future. In fact, the descender is running through our generation tonight. It has no coast. It has no port. It has no people that can survive. But the Jordan that leads to nowhere in this world into the dead seas and the stomping and the dumping grounds of our generation is the border that this church has to walk into today. The people of God were standing on the wilderness side. They had to cross Jordan to get to Canaan. The wilderness, another place. Another place, a wide open space without actual pasture. The country of nomads, distinguished because of its symbolism for faithlessness. It symbolizes lives without purpose. It signals, symbolizes circles. It symbolizes going nowhere. And there were the people of God in the land that goes nowhere, bordered by a Jordan that empties into the Dead Sea where nothing is alive. But the church, God handpicked them to become a passage into a land that flowed with milk and honey. And God said, I I'll send you through it. So that's what Joshua saw. Standing in the middle of the Jordan were the priests. And as their feet hit the water, the water began to part. And the priest walked to the midst of Jordan. And there they stood, the ark on their shoulders, the wind of God blowing through that river, that flooding unnavigable river become a path from, from wilderness to Canaan. And as long as those men stood in that Jordan, the people of God that wanted to fulfill the promise that was given in their heritage was able to pass into the Canaan land. God uses amazing methods. As aware as Joshua was, however, he probably didn't see what was really in that Jordan. Even though the water was standing at attention at the feet of faith, the ark symbolizing the power and the presence of God, commanding them. He didn't see Jesus in the Jordan that day. He probably didn't see what that ark represented as it related to Jesus Christ and the church. All he saw from his side was God 
and man working together. Opening up a passage into a promised land. And as long as that ark and those priests stood there, that passage was open from wilderness to Canaan. But God, who knows no time, who sees no, no boundaries from space. But God, my friend, saw more than just priests and an ark in that river. It could be argued that it was the same spot as God saw those priests standing in the midst of that Jordan. At the same spot, a place called Bethabra, that God saw another man. It was seemed like just a fleeting moment. And there he was, a man whom John called the Lamb. He was also walking down a road, and he crosses over the shoulder of the road, and he walks into a river by the name of Jordan. And he calls to a man by the name of John, and he says, John, baptize me. It is necessary to fulfill all righteousness. I submit to this congregation today that the feet resting on the Jordan riverbed that day was the feet of the Messiah, the true ark, the true mercy seat, whose own blood would be an atonement, the bread of heaven, He was the resurrection. He was the life. The man in whom embodied the law of God. It was at that baptism as that ark was in the middle of that river, Jordan, at a place called Bethabra, that God allowed it to be, hap to be said that when Jesus stood in that river, something else began to happen. Another passage began to open up, not on the earth, but in the heavens. The Bible says that the heavens opened and a spirit descended upon him like a dove. And a voice came out of the heavens and said, This is my son. That baptism I submit to you represented another passage from the south life to the spirit led life, from the wilderness of unbelief to a land of the supernatural. There is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, and he's standing in the Jordan to open up passages for our generation. <laughs> I wonder when Jesus stood in that Jordan if he as God may have took a trip in his mind to his creation You see, God has a thing about being alone. He don't like to be alone. He was standing in the Jordan alone. He remembers a time, possibly as God, when he was standing in a garden alone. Bible says God created because he was alone a man Adam and Eve when you read in the scriptures you'll find that Adam 1 Corinthians 15 Romans 5 was a type of Christ 
Romans 5 teaches us that Adam was a figure of the man which was to come. Adam foreshadowed Jesus. All that God, ladies and gentlemen, purposed in Adam was to be achieved in Jesus, the man. But God not only created Adam, he created Eve. Genesis 2 tells you about it. In fact, that creation, God building himself some partners, is carefully recorded. God's desire to have fellowship, to have people that will carry out his desires. God's creation of man was carefully written because he wanted the world to know that he has needs. He wanted man to know how to satisfy his heart. What made him Feel good. Genesis 2 says God created Adam. And out of Adam, Eve. Ephesians 5 teaches us that Eve was a type of the church. I would like to submit to this congregation today, and I'm so glad that I didn't have to preach last year because this year is where this fits. God's plan is not only achieved in Jesus. His plan was never meant to stop with Adam, but he had more in his mind <laughs> He was up to more. God's plan not only is achieved in Christ, but his plan is achieved also in the church. In order to understand the purpose of the church on this earth, you've got to look at Eve. I want you to look just for a moment at the position that the church occupies in relation to that work. In Genesis chapter 2, verses 18 through 24, the word woman is mentioned. In Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 through 32, a woman is again mentioned. I submit to you that the first woman is a sign typifying the church. The second is the reality of the first. The first woman was planned by God before the foundation of the world and appeared before the fall. The second woman was also planned before the foundation of the world, but was revealed after the fall. The one that appeared before the fall and the one that appeared after the fall. To God, there is no difference. The church is the eve of Genesis chapter 2. God created Adam, and it typified Christ. And God created Eve, and it typified the church. God's 
purpose is not only to be accomplished by Jesus, but also God needs the church. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, God said it this way. It isn't good for man to be alone. When you think about that Adam was created in the image and the likeness of God. When God created Adam, he was not only thinking of Adam, but he saw himself wrapped in flesh. When God said, it's not good for man to be alone, God was saying to us, I don't want to be alone. I want a help meet. <clears throat> Hear me right now. Christ alone is not good enough. It's only one half of the mind of God for this world. Christ alone is great, but it is not enough. We've got to do more than sing about what Christ has done for us. We've got to do more than talk about how glad we are to be redeemed. There is something that is close to the heart of God. That is for the church to be in its proper relationship with Jesus. Whoo, hallelujah. Put your hands together and let's clap our hands to the Lord right now. Hallelujah. Genesis 2, 19 and 20 says, and begins to tell us how God decided to meet the need that he had. I don't want to be alone. I created this man, but it's not good that he's alone. And so God set out to make him a help me. The scripture says that out of the ground God formed every beast of the field, bird of the heavens, brought them to man to see what he would call them. He gave them names. But listen to this. But for man, there was not a helpmeet found for him. Can you, can you picture God and Adam looking as all the animals paraded by? You know, God says, you got to have company. It's not good that you're alone. So the giraffe swaggers by, and God said, what do you think, bud? Adam says, I, I don't feel too good about that. I mean, you're the boss, but I don't feel real good about that. And the old orangutan numbers by. And God looks at him and says, what do you think, Bubba? You're getting closer, but... You see, God don't want to be alone. And I can see the arm of God as it waves over that fresh creation. And he slips into a divine coma and lays there. And God reaches out of the heavens into his side. And the flesh opens. And God grabs a rib and breaks it off and begins to form a helpmeet for Adam. <laughs> What was God really doing? I think he was smiling because he knew that in just a, a little while there would be another man that was put to sleep. The scripture calls him the second Adam, the last Adam, oh yeah, made in his likeness. He was going to put him to sleep. God don't like to be alone. 
But you see, ladies and gentlemen, nothing from the earth can be a help me to God. Nothing from the earth can satisfy God. So he had to take him, he had to take that help me out of Adam. God put the man to sleep and out of him he created Eve. <laughs> As he viewed a man hanging on Calvary with an open wound and blood and water flowing out. <laughs> and he smiled with anticipation because he knew that the church was not going to be of the earth, but the church was going to come out of Christ. <laughs> Woo! So Adam's helpmeet was a figure of the church. What does that mean? It means that since Eve, ladies and gentlemen, was a constituent of Adam, part of him, In fact, it was said, she is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. That's who Eve was. Eve formed from his rib. Eve was a constituent of Adam. Eve was Adam in another form. The church comes out of Christ. Who are you this afternoon? I am convinced that just as John became somewhat confused at the end of his ministry, at the dawning of a new era, so there is a spirit of confusion going through our generation. And Satan stands at the door of every Pentecostal church, every Bible-believing church, every child of God, and says, if you're the Son of God tries to cause us to doubt our identity. Do you know what will happen if we doubt who we are? We lose our faith. And when we don't have any faith, we don't have any power. And when we don't have any power, we don't have any results. And it's people that don't have results that wander in the wilderness for 40 years. It's people that don't have any faith that wander in the wilderness for 40 years. It's important that we know who we are. Saints of God, I submit to this conference today that we are more than just a bunch of believers who gathered together. We are more than just a bunch of apostolics. If Eve was bone of his bone, and flesh of his flesh, then you 
who have come out of his side, touched by blood, filled with the Spirit, are also Christ in another form. No wonder. Oh, it's dawning on me why he put his name on us. It's dawning on me why he's given us his authority. You can't have a body with no authority. Come on, everybody. Come on. We're more than the United Pentecostal Church. We're more than an organization. We're more than just a bunch of believers. We are the body of Christ, the flesh of God in this generation. Remain standing. That explains it to me. Why? We all feel these compelling urges to run to the nearest crisis. Bottle of oil in hand, home Bible study chart under our arm, looking over the booze bottles and sifting through the smoke. It's dawned on me why my daddy used to wake me up at 3 in the morning and say, Terry, you want to go with me? And we'd ride down to some other part of town one particular night with a big old strong, tall, burly, scary-looking guy come to the door. Dad looked at him and said, What's the matter, Gary? Brother Black, I need God. And I remember as a little boy, three in the morning, as I heard them pray in the other room, and I saw that 350-pound man in that kitchen with the bread on one side of the table and the jelly and the butter, but tears streaming down his face. You know what? We found out that Jordan ran right through his house. But he wanted to do more than just look across and dream. And so God did what he had done many times before. He walked into that Jordan in flesh through his help me. The church. And he opened up a pass. He said, Come on. I don't think it ought to dismay us because we stand looking where we want to go and there's a Jordan between. I don't think it ought to upset us because there's impossible situations between, between us and Canaan. I think we ought to understand that Jesus has stood in them. And he stood in them. And he's still in them. That is, if we understand that if Jordans are going to be crossed in 97, and God is going to stand in them, that we will have to do more than sit around and talk about how glad we are to be saved. I say that with all due respect. That is not a rebuke. <laughs> but Jesus did not fulfill the desire of the heart of God. Redemption takes care of man's problem. 
It restores man. It takes care of me. But what about God's needs? What about the original commandment when God looked at Adam and said, take dominion? Take dominion. It's time that we, like Jesus, who stood in the temple in Luke 4 and said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And he read Isaiah chapter 61. And then he closed the book. And he said, this day, this scripture is fulfilled in your ears. And he went out and he began to take dominion. It's not enough for us to just stand around and talk about who we think we are. If God is going to be satisfied by his church, I am convinced that he smiles when we open up passages. And we take authority over the obstacles. We take dominion. It took a while before it happened to me, but I remember my daddy telling me, oh, it's a wonderful thing what God will do for his people. He hadn't been in Kansas City three months, 1955. Brother Simeon, God gave him a dream. He said, Winfred, there's an apartment building across town. And in the dream, he saw a big apartment building. And in the dream, there were 13 people. And the Lord said, they're ready. Here's the address. And he woke up and said, Aline, God showed me an apartment. There's 13 people that need the Lord. And the Lord said, they're going to come. And so he found the street. And sure enough, there was the apartment box. And he went to the front door and knocked on the door. And Brother Stan, Sister Arnold came to the door. Big old rough looking lady. And Daddy looked at her and said, I'm starting a church here in town. Thought you might want to come and be a part of it. She looked at him and said, get out of my face, preacher, and slam the door. He didn't know it. He just thought he was going to another apartment. Went around to the back door of the same apartment. <laughs> Knocked on the door. Knocked on the door, and Sister Arnold came to the door. What do you want? He said, are you related to that mean old lady in the front? She said, are you really a preacher? He said, yeah. They got to talking. And before the month was out, 13 people in that building The only reason I tell you that is because I am saying to you today that Joshua built a monument. And that monument said what God wanted to do then, he still wants to do now. people in your towns are standing on the other side of Jordan and it's flooded, it's unnavigable, and they've lost precious things into it trying to get across. But 
Jesus is saying, man, I'm going to go stand in that Jordan. And that's the urge you're feeling. And make a passage. And then God smiles.